Okay. Psychologists said long, conf- long time, long term confinement would put the team under stress as they grow increasingly tired of each other's company. Psychological conditions can be even more challenging on a mock mission than a real flight, because the crew won't experience any of the euphoria or dangers of actual space travel. That's a good point. French participant Romain Charles said he was bringing along a, 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 a guitar to warm the atmosphere. Others said they would bring books, movies, and pictures of their relatives. The crew will split their days into eight hours of work, eight hours of sleep, and eight hours of leisure. So there you go. Mock Mission to Mars starts. How about that? Straight from the Associated Press, directly uh, mediated to you via the Chronicle Herald. Uh, Let me see the date on this bad boy. Friday, June 4th, 2010. How about that? Well, that's all the time we have today for the science technology news. Shall we listen to another segment of the uh, Andrew Bajago saga? Let's do it right here on the Unified Field. Let's enjoy a little bit more of Jessica Schaub's Andrew Bajago segment. I got to be honest with you, folks. uh, Just before we get into that. I had a conversation with some guys. I, I kind of work in the trade, so you know the you know the the guys I work with are kind of gruff, and uh, and that's fine. You know, we're all men's men in a way. Uh, and I had you know I had kind of briefed over this Mars thing, the synopsis with the guys at the table, and and I said, you know what? It's amazing that you know we're at this point now where it's going to take to the mid twenty thirties to orbit Mars with astronauts in the in in the shuttle. Like technology moves so fast that I would almost put money on the fact that we've probably been to Mars already, folks. And there are lots of other people that think the same thing. I'm not saying I totally believe that. I think it's possible. Because if you look at black ops operations, technology, consumer technology that we get are generally 10 to 20 years uh, of, of testing behind closed doors before we even get it, right? Military testing, black ops budgets and projects, they're 50, you know, anywhere from 30 to 50 years ahead of anything we're seeing right now. So why not? Why not? You know, we probably have the technology to solve all of the environmental crisis issues we're dealing with. We've probably been to local planets, in my opinion, you know. I think that's a completely possible thing. Who knows? Anyway, it's fantastic to know that uh, there is this project still in the works, and we are still funding space exploration, uh, even if it may not be the real space program, if you catch my drift. Where are you, Richard Hoagland? Please get a hold of me. Let's do a show. Anyway, let's go to the Audiophilia Zone, or the Audio Zone, as I like to call it for short, uh, with Jessica Schaub's uh, interview of Andy Brajago. I believe it's number f- three. Let's do this. <laughs> Research showed were, were developed at the behest of the Office of Naval Research to work with gifted and psychic children in specialized education, you know, advanced education. Mm-hmm. In my case, I was given in, in, in three years of grammar school in my third, fourth, and fifth grade. I was placed in a learning laboratory where I was given sort of a, a university history program in everything involving society and science in particular, science and applied technology. You know, applied science uh, from the year 1450, which would be the High Renaissance, which we would associate with, for example, Galileo. In fact, the name of this curriculum was Galileo, and the machines had been had been um, had had been developed at the instruction of the Office of Naval Research. They were designed at one of my father's former employers, which was the Thomas A. Edison Research Laboratory in West Orange, New Jersey. No connection to Edison. This, in fact, was a a defense R&D think tank like engineering company that was founded in around 1950. But it was actually physically adjacent to Edison's old lab uh, in West Orange. In fact, it shared a common doorway that was always locked with the old Edison labs that um, that Mrs. Clinton uh, re- refurbished and made into a national park when 
when President Clinton was president, and she realized that Edison's labs had been laying fallow for decades and had been ignored uh, by the American people and, and government. So my dad was working at the Edison labs from 1956 to 64, and during that time, these these speed learning machines for gifted students were actually constructed at the Edison Labs. Um, and they had taught us how to photo read. So we were getting all this history, history of society and history of science and technology crammed in our, into our heads during those three years of grammar school. And in fact, there were U.S. Army field hospital cots in the learning lab that we used to collapse onto and fall asleep because we were so exhausted after, let's say, two hours of standing there and doing all this saturation learning. This is at age uh, eight? Uh, this was, beg your pardon? Sorry, this was at age eight? Uh, I was in the learning lab from fall of 1969 to spring of 1972. So that, that would have been, I, I, I was seven going on eight when the third grade began for me, which would have been fall of 69. And I remember around October, oh, I don't know, I would guess maybe around October 5th of 1969 or so, I signed my security of, on U.S. Defense Department letterhead. In other words, we started school in September. We were placed in the learning lab. And right away there in fall of 69, they, they let us know that we were in a, 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 a U.S. Defense Department you know, classified research and development program. We were being trained for it. So they had us sign a, a secrecy of, kind of a loyalty of. And they began immersing us not only in the speed learning, but in uh, parapsychological testing and training, and very quickly they began to involve us in very far out stuff that was going on off campus. And so I can describe that a little bit later in, in this interview. But um, so this showing me that, that this Martian and, and telling me that I was going to be responsible for discovering it on the surface of Mars um, was pretty heady stuff, but it was the kind of stuff that was going on in my life around that time. I had already been dropped into Pegasus. I'm guessing this was probably after I'd been dropped into Pegasus. It might have been the summer beforehand. It might have been, let's say, summer of 16, or 70, but it was around that age when I first uh, started receiving the specialized education that I was given by the Defense Department to later be involved in the quantum access activities that I would be over the course of those next three years. But they definitely had the Mars data because my dad showed me that very photograph of the Martian that's in the paper. Um, now, the third Mars data point that I've, I've recollected is around 1970, this was definitely after my father had showed me the picture, my dad's, and, and after we were already teleporting from the, from building, the teleport in, build, in building 68 at the Curtis Wright Aeronautical Company facility in Woodridge, New Jersey, Oh, we were always jumping through a device there to the, the, the state capitol complex in Santa Fe, New Mexico. So after I had already done that with my dad once in 67, 68, when I was six years old, and then after I'd already been doing it during summer of 70 with the kids in my learning lab who were being, who were by that point attached to Project Pegasus and actively, if you will, time traveling, at least we were already teleporting back and forth between New Jersey and New Mexico. My dad said on a Saturday morning, I'm guessing, oh, this might have been around spring of 70, or actually, no, it had to be after we were already teleporting as a group. This must have been around fall of 70, because I know it was after we were already, um, I had already teleported with the other children in the program in summer of 70. So fall of 70 or thereabouts, my father says, come on, Andy, uh, we're going over to Curtis Wright. And I get in the car, and I'd always been, you know, I'd been trained how to keep projects information secret. So I waited to get into the car and he closed, you know, his door. And I said, Dad, are we teleporting to New Mexico? And, and he said, no, uh, I'm taking you over to Curtis Wright because there are some Martians there that I want you to meet. And again, I had, I had forgotten the earlier incident involving reading the passages from the paper and him showing me the photograph. This was another unusual event in my childhood in which he was bringing Mars up. And I said, what do you mean, Martians? And I just, I, as we drove over from our home in Morris Plains, New Jersey, to, the, to Curtis Wright in Woodridge, New Jersey, I really couldn't get my mind around what he was talking about. And my dad got exasperated, which was very unusual for 